Okay. How are you doing? All right. So this is your professor, Angela Kerwin. Welcome to my summer session here at Pierce College. Well, not actually here. I'm um, <laughs> in a former spare bedroom that used to belong to my son. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share screens in a little bit to the Canvas site for your class. And I just had a weird thing happen to me. I just spent an hour going over the directions for the first half of the first lab, exercise one in the lab manual. And I can't find the recording for it, which is really strange. Super weird. Um, never happened before. So hopefully this is recording. Hmm. Especially after working all day. So I'm um, tired. So I'm sorry if I'm feeling tired. It's not that I'm not enthusiastic. I've been up since 530 working in person. I'm like, come on, I just need to record a lecture for my online class. <laughs> like, what's wrong? <laughs> so um, I'm showing this course syllabus uh, for you guys class. And in this course syllabus, it has the original due dates for everything. I just want you to know for week one, um, I made the lab, lab assignments due on Sundays. So for week one, uh, to give people more time because I kind of underestimated that um, delay period when you guys are waiting to get your printed lab manuals. So you're thinking, I need to buy something? And I'm like, yeah, you do. <laughs> so um, if you're new to the class, just logging on. Um, the lab manual is required. It's uh, not expensive. It was written by teachers at Pierce College and LA Valley College specifically to save you guys money. If you're an EOP student, I believe there should be a stipend or some way for EOPS, EOPS to pay for it. So um, how to buy it? You go to lapiercecollegestore.com, click on buy, rent, sell enter the term Pierce 2021 summer, and then find the section number for it and buy it. That being said, if you want to get a head start before you get the lab manual, you absolutely can. So I recommend um, reading week one, uh, Pierce College start here, uh, completing discussion once you stay in this class. Everyone already has done that by today, Wednesday. And then click on the next link on the home page uh, that the title is lab number one, parentheses, X1, parentheses, scientific method and measuring indices. And you will please read, always in this class, read the campus assignment first. Because, it can't, because for my online classes, I still use the, the lab manuals, these things have one right in front of me on my desk, but I have to modify them so you can complete them online. So the primary directions for each exercise is on the Canvas site for this class. If you pick up this book and like go to lab four and just complete it and not look at the Canvas site, you're gonna realize, oh, we skipped lab four. I did it for nothing. Don't wanna do that. Nah, you're busy. You don't want to waste your time on stuff. So always go to the Canvas sites first. Um, so here's lab one. Lab one is the online version of exercise one in the printed lab manual. If you don't have the printed lab manual, that's okay. You, I made a copy of it, an old copy of mine, and I um, uh, uploaded to the Canvas site and linked to it. So you can download this copy or you can take pictures of it with your iPhone um, and uh, type out your responses on a file on your laptop and then copy and paste your typed out answers uh, as text when you hit start assignment. So you could do text entry and then, you know, blah, blah, blah. Or you can do file upload and take pictures of your file with your iPhone. So how people submit their work 
typically or almost always is by taking pictures um, with their smartphone. And on a smartphone, on Androids and iPhones, you can download a free app called Genius Scan. I'm going to show you what it looks like. Do you see in my left corner? So it's an orange app with a little white symbol of a camera aperture. So the aperture is like that hole in the front lens of the camera. And you click on it. And what it does is that you can use your camera, oh, that's me, <laughs> and take a picture of the pages of your lab manual and then hit plus. Yeah, cancel that. <laughs> and then it'll save it all in one continuous PDF file. You can just click right here and upload that file of your completed work. But wait, you think, how's that happen? How do I get my answers on a PDF file? Well, for some of you, or many of you, you may have um, I recommend getting Adobe Acrobat Pro DC if you're on a Mac. And as a student of LA Community College District, you should be able to get um, Adobe Acrobat for free. So here, and it's a way to open up PDF files. I think what comes with Apple computers is like Apple Pages or something, or one something, maybe it's OneNote, Microsoft. Anyway, just Google it. There, you don't, shouldn't have to spend any money. You'll just have to get on the internet and figure out, okay, how do I open up a PDF file and type on it? So in Adobe Acrobat, you can go up into, um, the file and edit and just say, you know, uh, edit text and images. And then you can type out your answers on almost any PDF file, even a sloppy one, kind of crooked, like the ones, <laughs> copies I made of these pages of the lab manual. So that's how you submit your work. Um, you can take, you can submit your work by filling out the physical pages and taking pictures of them with your iPhone, right? Uh, or taking pictures of them with your iPhone using Genius Scan, and then emailing it to yourself, and then uploading it from your laptop. Um, if you downloaded the app for Canvas, um, there's my teacher one right there. So you would have the student one. So you, you don't want teacher, you want student. <laughs> and very often you can open it up and then complete your work you know, find your Canvas site for your college where you're at, and you can type in your answers just right off your smartphone. Um, Android, Samsung, and um, iPhone. So there's lots of different ways to submit your work in this class. If you're not used to taking an online class, uh, it's going to feel a little awkward at first. It just is. But change and learning things is always awkward. And it just it just is, so it might take the maybe the first lab might take you the longest once you figure out a system that's easy for you, but um, again you shouldn't have to pay anything if you're an EOPS student and stuff, and so you just got to get really active on figuring out the system, and I apologize if it takes a little while this first week. Speaking of the first week, I just postponed the due date on everything except for the discussion to Sunday, June 20th. By the way, that is Father's Day. So if you have a dad or you are a dad, uh, maybe you want to try to get it done on Saturday, the day before, so you're not messing up a holiday, a special holiday for you. Okay, so in this um, lecture, I'm going to go over the second half of lab one, which is based on, which is titled exercise one, the scientific method. It begins on page seven 
and it's like really in two parts. The first part is all about the scientific method. You do the thought experiment. I already recorded an hour lecture on that to find all the terms. <sighs> I hope my lecture comes up in Canvas and um, not Canvas and um, Zoom. It's weird. Um, and then the second one is the second half of it has to do with measuring an index. So what is an index? An index is the ratio of two measurements. If that doesn't mean much to you, I don't blame you. I'm like, okay, well, who cares? The ratio, what is ratio? So a ratio is when you divide one number by another. So you're like, okay, who cares? Um, an index <laughs> is a numerical value that describes the shape of something. So you have, so when you do science, there's different, you define your data, right? So you could define it numerically or uh, another word for that is quantitatively. So examples of quantitative data would be age or income, you know, anything that are that is a number that can be compared to another number. That's quantitative data, numerical data, qualitative data or ethnographic data, if you want to get all cultural and anthropological on it are opinions and words that can't be put to numbers easily. Well, you can, but you have to use a little Likert scale and like a customer service type of, you know, for example, customer service things, um, when you evaluate things. But qualitative data are words and you can't do statistical analysis on words. So an index is a way to quantify a qualitative, were word data point. So for example, look at this shape on the screen. What is that? It's a square, S-Q-U-A-R, right? It's a square. Um, but how do you compare that shape to another shape numerically? You can measure the width of the square right? I'm going to do a little box, the width of the square, and then take a measurement of the height of the square, and then divide them. And a way to, to show something's divided by another is to put a forward slash. So width, forward slash, height equals width divided by n to make an index or a numerical value that describes the shape. You take that width divided by height and multiply it by 100. Okay, so let's get started. Let's pretend you have your printed copy of the lab manual. And you're going to take what you need to complete this lab is a ruler with millimeters on it. So millimeters are tiny little points of measurement um, that it takes about um, 254 millimeters to equal an inch. Or, no, that's not true. It takes about 25 millimeters to make an inch. 2.54 centimeters equal an inch. Ah, sorry. So you just need a ruler. So you can buy a ruler at a 99 cent store. You can buy rulers at bonds, a lot in some bonds and some Rite Aids or CVS pharmacies, just like a little educational section if you don't have a ruler. So you just need a ruler for this class. Um, I've tried the measuring apps on the phone and they kind of work, but it's easier if you just do ruler, even if you take the ruler and put them on your screen. <laughs> <laughs> and measure your screen. So you can kind of see from my old lab manual from years ago that I measured this shape A and the width is 50 millimeters 
and the height is 50 millimeters. So to calculate the index, I'm going to take the width divided by the height times 100. So 50 divided by 50 times 100 equals 100. That's right. So an index is a ratio of two measurements that describe a shape. And that number that describes a shape, the closer it is to 100, the more uniform is the shape. Meaning if it's a angular shape, like a rectangle or a square, if the index is 100, it is actually a square. It's not a rectangle. If it's not 100, it's not a square. What if you measure a round shape like a skull? So if you want to take a cranial index or what is called a cephalic index, they mean the same thing. Cephalic is like an old timey word for it. You take the width of the head and divide it by the length of the head times 100. And that gets the cephalic index. Why is this important in anthropology? Well, because to determine what species paleoanthropologists dug out of the ground when they had these fossilized pieces of skull and they put them all together in the lab and they're like, are we looking at a little chimpanzee or are we looking at a little hominem? Hmm. Well, hominems, humans, have rounder skulls. So the indices are closer to 100 than monkeys and chimpanzees. So an index is a quantification that describes a shape, not a measurement and not the size. An index means shape. So on exercise 1.2, you're gonna go measure square A, it's gonna be 50 millimeters or 49, and measure um, width and height the width and height are the same. So your ruler might be a little off. It might say 49, not 50, whatever. It doesn't matter. What matters is that the height is the same as the width. And you come out, you calculate the index and the index equals 100. So answer the two questions in the middle of page 13. Is this index a length? No. Number four, what exactly does this index tell you about box A? It's a uniform shape. It's a uniform rectangular shape. In normal English, it's called a square. Number five, repeat the measurements and calculations for box B. In box B, if I measure my lab manual, because actually I whited it out on this copy and I can't remember. If I measure it in millimeters, um, it comes out to 37 millimeters in height. I measure the width, 37 millimeters. So what's 37 divided by 37? One. What's one times 100? 100. It's the same index. Box A and box B are the same shape because they have the same index. So index describes shape. Six, how does box B differ from box A? It's smaller, but it's the same shape. That's the answer. Seven, repeat the measurements and calculations for box C. And box C is on page 14. I'm going to measure the width on my lab manual. Do, do, and I come out with, oh, it's about 50 millimeters. And I measure the height and it's about 37 millimeters. So what's the index for box C? So what is 37, which is the height, divided by the width, which is 50, 74. So notice 74 is not the same as 100. Thus, box C is not a square, it's not uniform. Eight, how does box C differ from box A? 
Box C is a different shape. Then we get to the metric analysis of the body. The metric analysis of the body. Anthropometry, that word is, word is bold, so bolded, so you know, ooh, that's an important word. I may get a question about that later, and you are correct. You skip all the way to the back, and you see the study questions. You're like, oh, eight, what is the study of anthropometry? Okay, the answer is all the way here on the bottom of page 14. So if you really want to speed through these, pro tip, if you will, go straight to the study questions in the back after you hit Canvas and make sure that I assign the study questions. So we're going to go to Canvas. We're going to go to Lab 1. Did she assign the study questions? What did she do? OK, Lab 1 recorded videos. OK, not there. Exercise 1.2, have to do that. Exercise 1.3, have to do that. Exercise 1.4, have to do that. Um, hold on. Study questions. Yes. So you have to answer the study questions. So always go to the Canvas site first. OK. All right. So Study question number eight asks you what anthropometry is. The answer is on the bottom of page 14. You can just write it verbatim exactly, right? Anthropometry is a study of measurements of the human body. Um, now, the early anthropologists tried to apply the scientific method to categorizing people. And law enforcement in different countries like the United States and England and Germany tried to, uh, one needed a way to identify suspects um, rather than qualitative descriptions. So he was tall with dark hair. They wanted quantitative data. They wanted the measurements of the head. They wanted how, what that person weighed, uh, what kind of nose they had. So they created and they also had this kind of superstition, kind of like palm reading that, you know, how some people believe the lines in your hand can tell your future and, um, and give uh, ev some information about your character. Your Well, they thought the shape of your head can kind of tell your future, if you will, if you're likely to commit crimes. And this, they created a pseudoscience. A pseudo means fake. So they made a fake science. What's fake science? Fake science is claiming to use the scientific method, but then cherry picking facts to prove your point and not using a representative sample or just making up shit. <laughs> Phrenology is, on, is bolded term. It's on page 15. P-H-R-E-N-O-L-G-Y is kind of like palm reading, but they thought it was the, sh the shape of your head kind of kind of determine your future if you were uh, a bad person or not. <sighs> so also it was a way, um, there are certain regional similarities in called ancestry markers in bones. So for example, some people with Native American or East Asian ancestry may have a little flared um, zygomatic arches, maybe a little differently shaped eye orbits. They may have uh, incisors, which are the front teeth, or they may not. So the problem again with ancestral markers, all it does, it gives you an idea of what the person may have looked like, but there are so many exceptions it really cannot determine what ethnic group or ancestral group or race they are. It, it just can't. Um, but early anthropologists tried to create numbers to describe shape of heads. And they tried to make a claim that certain head shapes uh, were only in people in uh, our own, were present in people who were from Southern Europe countries like Italy and Greece and Turkey and maybe Africa. Um, and so they tried to, again, these were kind of 
racist people and they really try to like make a claim that there's something biologically different about non-Europeans and they failed. <sighs> so the, another early use of anthropometry, like I said, was trying to determine, um, make categories of people based on where they're from and also try to identify um, perpetrators of crimes and used in um, crime cases. And also it was used to define different racial groups in first to the United States, and then it was adopted by the Nazis in Germany when these racist books were translated into German. So the Nazis just actually acted on these ideas more so than the Americans for that very often wrote about them first. Bad. So taking Nowadays, what is anthropometry used for? Well, actually it's used for everything from clothing design to designing cars, um, airline seats, though you wouldn't think so because they're always too small for at least me and my family. <laughs> <laughs> so anthropometry is a useful tool in science for anything that has to do with um, humans fitting into it. So uh, transportation like cars and trains and seats to uh, bicycle or motorcycle helmets to patterns and clothing. Um, so anthropometry is still used. It's just not used. Um, oh, and it's also used to identify species of hominin. For example, the cranial index of non-human or non-human ancestors um, generally are less uniform. So they're around in the 60s and 70s. Um, whereas um, humans are around the 70s and 80s. So there are some um, um, numbers that you can use to, to determine if you're looking at a, a fossilized skull and you're like, was that a little baby human or a little baby homo? Naledi or something. You're like, oh, no, that's not the proportions of a human. It's just homo naledi. Okay, so that's give you a little background. So we're going to use, if you were in my in-person lab, I would have you guys use two different types of tools to measure things. So I created a web page on the Canvas site with pictures of these tools. And um, there we go. I also put pictures of these tools on the Canvas assignment. So the tool to measure things like nasal cavities, noses, seeds, and bird beaks is called a sliding caliper. Okay, I'm holding a sliding caliper in my hand. Why do I own one of these? Uh, I don't know, I'm a nerd, anthro nerd. <laughs> you do not ever have to buy one of these. Don't waste your money. They're kind of expensive if you buy them new, so and you don't get like the institutional discount like uh, Pierce College would. So, um, so botanists use these to measure leaves, um, insects, entomologists and stuff, and anthropologists use these or paleoanthropologists you'd say. So um, this is a sliding caliper. It's used to measure the nasal index and other small items that will be on quiz one. So what do you measure skulls or the cephalic index? The spreading caliper, it's a picture on your screen and also you can see the little box picture me. This is a spreading caliper. This is a digital one. Um, so I can turn it on. And oh, by the way, I nicknamed my skull, which is a skull of a male, but I don't know, I'm a woman. So I'm just gonna call her Frida. So, or is it Ingrid? Oh, it's Ingrid for this class, Never mind. So she's Ingrid. <laughs> um, and so if I wanna measure her skull width, there's two points right above the temporal bones, which are colored black, or I mean brown in this skull of mine, this teaching skull. And they're right above the ear holes, which we call the super auditory meatus. Let me put my finger in an ear hole. And so it's kind of, let me give you the back view. It's kind of the widest part of the skull and the width in millimeters is, oh, 
138 on this skull. That may not match the number I give you in the Canvas assignment. So this is really important. You don't have, need any tools. I'm gonna to give you the numbers. You just have to figure out the cephalic and nasal and later pelvic indices. So if you, so I'm asking you to figure out Ingrid's cephalic index. And so the head width is 122. So probably got it from another skull. Head length is 165. But I wanna show you how to measure the head width and head length so you learn this research method of anthropology. So there's these points um, on either side, just where the kind of the parietal bones interact with all come together. So this is a, a frontal bone where my finger is on this blue section. The green section's a parietal. The brown section's a temporal. The, the red section's a sphenoid. Um, you don't need to know all those for this lab, but next week we're going to learn these bones. So get ready. <laughs> it's anthropology, study humanity. So um, this little point where these all kind of interact is called a uron, um, E U. R O N or Y O N. It's in the lab manual. And so you want to measure from this left uron to the right uron. So you're gonna, in class, you take the spreading calipers, right? But for this class, since it's online, you just need to know what the uron is. And I'm just going to give you this number of the head width. So you don't need to measure anything because I'm going to give you the numbers. I'm going to give you the measurements. But you do need to calculate the cephalic index. So look at the screen. So what's 122 divided by 165 times 100? Um, and then you have to identify the category of Ingrid's head shape. So I'm going to go here, share screens to a copy of the lab manual pages. I think that's it. Yep. And there's some categories of different head shapes. So a head shape that with an index that's below 75 is called dolichocephalic. Dolichocephalic. A dolic is from um, a Greek word meaning thin or narrow, and cephalic has to do with cranium or head. So it's narrow head. And you can see kind of a drawing here, which says number one. That's a category of cephalic index or category of head shape. And mesocephalic is kind of in the middle, medium cephalic, right? And then brachiocephalic, brachy is from the Greek word for um, round or wide. And so it's more of a round head or wide head shape. And you can see it on page 18 with as a rounder head. Now, the early, some of the early anthropologists tried to make a claim that inferior people were had very dolicephalic and brachiocephalic heads. But we, um, so they are biologically inferior because they have a different than the average head shape. Most people are mesocephalic. Well, that's not true at all. And actually it has nothing to do with your ancestry or genetics or very little to do. And it has more to do with how your parents left you in your crib when you were an infant. So typically uh, infants who were left to sleep on their sides had kind of longer heads and infants that were left to sleep with their head, sometimes on a special pillow, always on their backs, um, have little rounder heads and less narrow heads. So it has really nothing to do with your biology and everything to do with like cultural child rearing, child rearing practices. Um, so um, if you can, you can measure your own head and just write, hey, this is my own head. Um, maybe you could do it with someone helping you out and holding a ruler over your head and going, okay. <laughs> so that might be kind of fun to see what category you are, but I'll give you a warning. Um, if you feel that you may be have an inferior size head, one, that's nonsense. There's no scientific basis to phrenology. Um, 
And two, just know that Charles Darwin himself, a known person who kind of uh, helped co-invent the theory of natural selection with Alfred Wallace, Charles Darwin had a very round head. <laughs> and he was discriminated against to a certain extent when he was younger, when he was in his early 20s and he wanted to become a naturalist. Um, he applied to become a naturalist at an exploratory ship called the HMS Beagle, and he had to get references uh, to show that even though he didn't have a kind of a strong jaw and his head was really round, he had to, I mean, they were just obsessed with this crazy stuff in the 1800s. Um, anyway, long story short, he's a genius, the smartest people ever to live who really influenced science. Charles Darwin himself would have been categorized as inferior by these Nazi idiot races, so whatever. <laughs> You're in good company. <laughs> All right, so how do you measure the nasal index? Again, I give you the measurements on the Canvas assignment. All you have to do is do a little bit of math. So uh, here's the nasal index. I have it highlighted in yellow now in the Canvas assignment. Uh, the nasal width divided by the nasal height times 100 and just um, give Ingrid's nasal, nasal index and her type of nose shape. So the nose shape categories are printed in the lab manual or you can find them on the PDF file. And um, these are nasal indices are divided into several categories. Let me tell you what those words mean from their ancient Greek and Latin roots. So leptor, Uh, is short for narrow, okay? So, leptor or lepto equals narrow. So I may ask you in quiz one, um, um, how would you categorize a nose with a nasal index of 55? What category? of nose would that be? And that would be a leptorine. So smaller numbers are more narrow, leptos for narrow. Um, reen is a Greek root word that means nose. So think of the animal rhinoceros, right? Um, a rhinoceros is a um, animal known to have a big, huge horn on its nose, right? Um, rhinoplasty, that is a plastic surgery on the right, no rhino, on the nose. <laughs> so rhin is short for kind of means nose, lepto means narrow. How about platy? So platy means broad or wide. So platy means wide. So what kind of nose would be a platyrrhine? A platyrrhine nose would be a wide nose. So the nostrils, the, um, the nason to nason, or the alaire to alaire, these outside the nostrils are a little bit wider. So people with platyrrhine nose have more of a wide nose. Um, hyper means more. So hyperplatyrrhine means wider. Ultra platyrrhine means even wider. Um, mezzarine means middle. Mezzo means middle. And so I just wanted to explain to you kind of where they get these, where do they make these words out of it? Well, scientific words are typically made out of, are made up words from ancient Greek and Latin roots. The reason why they did that is because science started in Europe and they had to create a universal language that elites and royalty who had an education could understand. And even up until 100 years ago, very wealthy and royal people had to take at least one or two years of Greek and Latin. So if you grew up in Germany or Norway or Italy, um, even though you didn't speak English or French, you would understand these terms because they were all based on Greek and Latin, which you had to take back in the day. Nowadays, if you're a pre-med student and wanting to get to healthcare, it's probably a good idea to just take one class of of um, scientific terms in Latin and Greek. So um, let's make it easier learning all those words. Thanks. 
So um, I think I got through everything, type of head, type of nose shape, head shape. Um, the little point, like when you measure a head length, you measure it right down the middle. This is called the mid sagittal plane. Uh, next week, we're gonna learn the different bones of the skull and sutures. Sutures are when two bones together and this middle suture that I have my finger on, on the green here in the, the screen of my teaching skull is called a sagittal suture. Um, so you measure the length of the head right down the middle along the mid sagittal plane, right? From a point on the occipital bone that's most distant back posterior side of the skull, it's called a pistocranium, it's a little point, to the part of the cranium, the neurocranium that's most anterior or most in front, and that's called the glabella. So I have my finger, my um, one finger on the glabella between the eyes and measure on the pistocranium. You don't need to know pistocranium or glabella for quiz one, don't worry about it. Just know what an index is, how to calculate an index, and know the answers to the study questions. Like, you know, how was anthropometry once used for criminal identification? Uh, what's a sliding caliper used for? What's a spreading caliper used for? What is a nasal index? And then you'll be just fine. I hope that you find that helpful. And um, there you go. So that should complete. I just made two uh, recorded Zoom caption lectures for part one of lab one and part two of lab two. And the next lectures I'm going to post will be for lab number two titled natural selection. And again, um, anytime you want to start a lab, please, please make your life easier. Go to the home page. Oop, let me leave student view here so I don't crash things. And um, read the Canvas assignment first. So I have lab two, then there's the Canvas assignment and always read the campus assignment first before you start on the lab so you don't do unnecessary work. All right, take care, thanks.